Okay, guys, let's uh, get going. So, welcome to our second uh, Distinguished Visitors Lecture of the Year. Um, and uh, on behalf of the Distinguished Visitors Committee, who is uh, Professor Amr Kode, and Virginia Tory, myself, and where is Ali, Ali Durman, <laughs> Uh, we are very pleased to present uh, uh, David Lepofsky, and I'm very um, pleased to introduce him. Mr. Lepofsky is what I can only describe as a force of nature. He is also, I would say, a personal hero and a friend. I first came to learn of him when he appeared as a talking head on television, uh, on a television screen in London, Ontario, when I was doing the bar ads, literally last millennium. Uh, and he was do he basically was uh, took part in the bar admission course in his capacity as as the chair of the public law section, and so Mr. Lepofsky is a lifelong disability rights advocate, blind lawyer, and chair of the nonpartisan grassroots accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act Alliance. The alliance works to advance the full participation of persons with disabilities in Ontario through effectual accessibility standards development. He is also co-chair of Barrier Free Canada. Through these organizations, he is now campaigning for amendments to the proposed Federal Accessible Canada Act from 1994 to 2005. Mr. Lepofsky led the fight to win the enactment of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Act. In the early 1980s, he took uh, active part in the successful campaigns to get disability equality included in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Ontario Human Rights Code. David has had a long and successful career as a lawyer with the Ontario Ministry of the Attorney General, practicing in the areas of constitutional, civil, administrative, and most recently criminal law. He retired in 2015 from the prestigious position uh, with the prestigious position of general counsel. Uh, David is currently a part-time visiting professor of legal ethics and public interest advocacy uh, at the uh, Faculty of Law at Osgoode, and he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto. He has won uh, many, many awards, and I won't uh, go into those at length uh, because we don't have the time, but he was awarded the Order of Canada in 1995, he was awarded the Order of Ontario in 2007, and in 2010, the Canada, Canadian Lawyer Magazine listed Mr. Lepofsky among Canada's 25 most influential lawyers. So in a minute, I will allow him to speak. The one thing that I would draw your attention to is he is also speaking from 5 to 7 this evening at the uh, Carol Shields Auditorium. We will post this information on the Robson Hall website in the events calendar. Um, and he will be talking about making disability rights a reality, what will it take? And so without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. Lepofsky. Thank you and good afternoon. It's, it's, it's really an honor to be able to speak to you and to be brought in as an extinguished visitor or whatever I'm called. <laughs> I don't know whether I'd rather be X or dist, but I'm one of those things. Uh, one correction my v v on my CV, I'm the past co-chair of the of Barry Free Canada, but in any event. Uh, you came to law school to study to be admitted to the bar of justice. I'm going to challenge you today in the first year class in a more extensive lecture tomorrow that if you want to be admitted to the bar of ju justice, <laughs> You have an ethical obligation to, at the same time, admit yourself to the bar of social justice. We as lawyers, you as future lawyers, have a powerful ethical <coughs> obligation to take the knowledge and skills that you learn here at law school and to apply them not only for the individual clients you will serve, but also for broader communities, communities that can't normally benefit from the services lawyers provide because, frankly, they can't afford them. And also to assist them not only tackling individual cases or individual tr problems through individual cases, but to look at entire communities and say, where are the systemic recurring problems and where are the sy systemic legal fixes that we can find for them? Not necessarily in the courtroom, 
possibly through new policy, possibly through new legislation. I will be giving examples and ideas about how to do this tomorrow in the first year class, but today I want to drive home the message by using one example, an example that has culminated in a bill that is before Parliament right now, that just finished second reading, that is going to standing committee <coughs> hearings in the next couple of weeks, at which I'm going to have the privilege of being one of the, the many presenters. So what's the problem? To tackle any social justice issue, you have to begin by identifying the problem. Well, the problem is as simple as it is pervasive. We live in a society here in Manitoba, back in Ontario, across the country, indeed around the world. We live in a society which is designed and operated on an unarticulated, yet omnipresent and basically ridiculous premise. That ridiculous premise is that it is there for the participation of people only without disabilities. People who don't have a physical or mental or sensory or mental health or neurological or intellectual or learning or other kind of disabilities. Now, that premise pervades our public transit systems, our education systems, our stores, our restaurants, the goods we shop for, our websites, indeed, even our laws and the courts that administer them are all infected and indeed pervaded by this ridiculous premise. Now, before I go any further, I want to find out how many of you are affected by this crazy, ridiculous practice. I want to do it by, well, we're in law school, by a survey. And, of course, we're in law school, so it's going to be completely unscientific, <laughs> and therefore admissible as an exception to the hearsay rule. <laughs> because it's inherently reliable, because it's unscientific. I want to know if this touches your life. So would you please raise your hand if you have no disability now and are certain you'll never get one for the rest of your life? Raise your hand, please. I, I don't see any hands. <laughs> Funny that, I never do. I, I told you it was unscientific. I kept my word. We are the strangest minority of all we people with disabilities because we are the minority of everyone. Everyone either has a disability now or has a, someone near and dear to them who has a disability or will get one <coughs> later in life. It's just, na that's nature. We are the minority of everyone. So we live in a society that is designed in a way that ultimately has barriers against the minority of everyone. Let me give you just one illustration. I'd like to run a four minute video Part of doing community disability advocacy, applying the skills we teach you here, is reinventing yourself. One of the things I've done is reinvented myself the past couple of years as, go figure, a blind videographer. <laughs> Roll the video, please. That new public transit stations are fully accessible to passengers with disabilities. They recently renovated the Toronto Union Station's Go Transit area. On most of the train platforms, they added several leaning pillars. <laughs> My white cane taps the ground and tells me there's no obstacle there. But then my shoulder or head hits the leaning pillar. The tactile walking surface indicator has a wayfinding path on the York University subway station platform. It's supposed to guide me along the platform, but it has a serious problem. I come downstairs to the platform. This tactile path guides me forward a few meters. <laughs> and then right into a wall. For safety, it's important to have a key detectable tactile walking surface indicator with proper color contrast all along the edge of a train platform. Here is an unsafe platform at the renovated <coughs> Union Station Go Transit area. Its edge doesn't have tactile safety warning at the Bloor and Weston stations on the UP Express line. These tactile surface safety warnings are provided at some points along the platform, but not along the edge of the platform that I have to travel along to get to the UP Express platform. Another place where we need a tactile marking on the ground for safety is when I come to a boundary between a safe pedestrian sidewalk and an adjacent road or driveway. 
I walk along the exit path from the Bloor Station on the UP Express Line. It leads out to the Kiss and Ride passenger pickup area. I walk from the sidewalk right into the driveway. Because there's no tactile warning, I don't know I've walked into the path where cars can drive. There should be a tactile walking surface indicator there to keep everyone safe. York University subway station has two entrances. Only one has an elevator. The other entrance is inaccessible if you can't use stairs or an escalator. If the one elevator at the accessible entrance breaks down, then the entire station becomes inaccessible. Here at the inaccessible entrance, it looks like space was allowed for an elevator, but none was installed. The main staircase inside the York University subway station has really bad railings. They aren't consistently placed at a right angle to the stairs. Instead, at least some of the railings are unsafely skewed at a weird angle to the stairs. I try to use the railing to guide me up or down the stairs. The railing forces my feet off at an angle. These are bad for blind people and for people who are unsteady on their feet. It's good that the New York University subway station has automatic power doors. They automatically slide open when you walk close to them. You don't have to find and press a button. The Bloor Street UP Express station's power doors are not automatic. To open the door off Bloor, you must grope around and find a button which is too far from the door. When that door swings open, it can hit someone. Let's take a quick look at the other entrance to the York University subway station. The one that is inaccessible because it has no elevator. It's good that a sign outside that entrance says that there is an accessible entrance elsewhere. But where did they put this important sign? It's right beside the automatic doors to the entrance. When the doors slide open, which is often the case, you can't see the sign. When crossing the road here, it's good that outside this inaccessible entrance, there's a curb cut at the roadside. This lets someone using a wheelchair, scooter, or walker get down to the road level to cross the street. But when you cross to the other side of the street, there's no curb cut to let you get back up to the sidewalk. Learn more at www.aodaalliance.org. Write us at aodafeedback at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at AODA Alliance. For a longer version of this video, go to YouTube and search on Transit and AODA Alliance and Long Version. <clears throat> Spielberg, I ain't. <clears throat> but this problem pervades whether it's the design of our buildings or the way we operate our school systems or all other, or indeed all other aspects of life. Now, what's adds to the absurdity of these situation, this situation is that all of these barriers, one way or another, are illegal. They're so illegal that we won't put them on one of your law school exams because there's no, where do you draw the line, or is this a tough issue? They're, they're completely, obviously illegal. They violate human rights legislation in each province or federally, and where they're implemented by or on behalf of the government, they also violate the equality rights guarantee in section 15 of the Charter of Rights. The only vaguely interesting legal question is how long these laws afford organizations to remove these barriers. But not, there's no question that they've got to be removed and that new barriers need to be created. The problem that we face with these laws is twofold. Number one, they require us as individuals with disabilities to have to become private accessibility cops tackling one barrier at a time. And most people with disabilities don't have the time or the money to hire lawyers uh, to do that. And the other problem with these law, the Human Rights Code and the Charter, they've got great rights. They've been judicially interpreted in a way that would make us all proud but they don't provide specific clear, clear uh, directions to an obligated organization about such things as whether a restaurant should provide a braille menu, or how to set up your website, or where to put tactile warnings on the floor uh, so that uh, people with vision loss uh, can navigate safely in public spaces. So that's the problem. There is a solution. But before I tell you about it, I want to offer you uh, an opportunity to learn more, 
well beyond what we're going to talk about here today. If you'd like to learn more about this, I want to make two, uh, two suggestions beyond inviting you to come to the public community event uh, at 5 o'clock this afternoon. The first is, we're going to pass a pad around, Patrick please pass the pad around, for people to sign up to receive email updates about action on this front nationally in Ontario and in Manitoba. Just print your email address, if you need assistance, just let us know. Just print your email address and we'll sign you up to start receiving these email updates. They will provide you with specific action ideas, current news, and for those of you who are interested in social justice advocacy, but not necessarily in disability issues, these will provide you with a, a really good illustration uh, of how to, how to engage uh, in this kind of social justice advocacy. The second way to learn more is, frankly, to follow us on Twitter. Now, normally in a law school class like this, it's considered rude to take out your smartphone. I'm going to violate that requirement and invite you right now to take out your smartphone or your computer and follow at David Lepofsky on Twitter, D-A-V-I-D-L-E-P-O-F-S-K-Y. Follow us on Twitter. We provide current updates on all sorts of breaking news about accessibility across Canada and around uh, the world. By the way, this is being recorded for video. If anyone watching this on video wants to sign up for our updates, send an email to aodafeedback at gmail.com. I repeat, aodafeedback at gmail.com. And all you have to say is, sign me up. Now, back to our regularly scheduled program. The advertisement's <laughs> over. Uh, so I've described the problem. What do we do about it? Well. I've had the privilege of having an opportunity to learn about this and be involved in this in social justice advocacy terms, which I'm going to describe more to the first year class uh, tomorrow. But in a nutshell, what we found is that we need new comprehensive accessibility legislation, which is effectively enforced by the government so that we don't have to be private accessibility cops, and which provides specific directions in the form of accessibility regulations that tell obligated organizations what they've got to do and when they've got to do it by. Now the good news is that Ontario passed such legislation in 2005 and Manitoba passed similar legislation in the year 2013. Nova Scotia followed last year and now at least British Columbia and Newfoundland are looking at doing the same. That's to address barriers in the provincial sphere. There's room for a long debate and we're engaged in extensive advocacy of what's going uh, uh, on trying to get these laws effectively enforced. More about that at the end of my talk. However, that only addresses barriers in the provincial sphere. And indeed, most of the barriers we face are uh, the kind which provincial governments can regulate. But there are a number of barriers that face people with disabilities, accessibility barriers, that are in the federal sphere. I hate to bore you with first year constitutional law, but Heck, I do sometimes teach some constitutional law, so I got to do it. They're this just taking division of powers right now, so this is good. Just finish the class. All right, <laughs> sorry. You'll get over it, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> this is you, well get, you get no sympathy from me, because when I was in law school, or this is the old guy talking 40 years ago, we had no charter rights, so all we learned was division of powers. <laughs> <laughs> so you get no sympathy from me. <laughs> but barriers in banking, in air travel, barriers in, uh, in uh, broadcast television and radio and so on, barriers in telecommunication services, in telephone and cell phone uh, services, uh, and the hardware relating to them, uh, barriers in the postal service, barriers in all federal, federal services, and barriers in anything that is part funded in whole or in part by federal money. So the federal government can also reach it, when they give money to a college or a university or a public transit authority uh, to address, uh, to build a new building or create some new infrastructure, uh, the federal government could affect that too through federal accessibility strings tied to that money. Well, even though we have a Canadian Human Rights Act that bans discrimination because of disability, and even though we have disability in the Charter of Rights in Section 15, the ban on, equality, uh, on discrimination because of, of various grounds, uh, we don't have comprehensive national accessibility legislation 
comparable to that which Ontario and Manitoba and, uh, have passed. However, the good news is we're in the process of getting that legislation. So while you're in law school, one of the historic moments has just opened up now. Bill C-81 was introduced for first reading by the uh, Justin Trudeau government uh, on June 20th of this year. It just passed second reading a week ago. It's going to standing committee hearings now. Uh, and I believe the federal government aims to get it passed by the House of Commons this fall, uh, with a view to it going to the Senate and being passed, uh, if possible, before the election next fall. This bill comes from the disability community. We mounted a campaign, many of us, I was but one player and I and my coalition, back in the 2015 election, using Twitter and other uh, uh, strategies to get commitments from the federal uh, NDP, <coughs> Greens, and uh, Liberals uh, to pass a national accessibility law. The previous uh, Harper Conservative government had itself promised national accessibility legislation back in 2006, but never brought a bill forward or consulted on what it should include. So we're now at a point, and this happens only rarely uh, when you do social justice advocacy, of reaching the point where we have a government commitment and after a public consultation, a government bill with an intention to bring it forward. So what I want to do is take a few minutes to talk to you about what this bill uh, provides and where it needs to be strengthened. In, in a nutshell, it's a good start but it's a weak bill. And without substantial strengthening, it may change little, it may change nothing. However, there is a roadmap on how to effectively strengthen it. We've tabled that in the form of a brief a week ago. Others have done the same with comparable recommendations. And we're now involved in a campaign uh, to try to get the federal government to act on our recommendations. And indeed, I encourage you as individuals to consider adding your voice to ours. So what does the bill do? Where is it good and where does it fall short? Well, it's good that it's called the Accessible Canada Act and that it says in its subtitle or longer title that it's, it's about achieving a Canada without barriers insofar as the federal government can. Well, that's great. And it's good that it creates a new minister responsible for accessibility and it provides uh, for the establishment of uh, a National Accessibility Standards Organization, the Canadian Accessibility Standards Development Organization. Yeah, there's a new word, CASDO. <laughs> and that organization would be able to bring together experts and recommend what should be in an accessibility standard. Indeed, proclaim non-binding accessibility standards that folks can start following as soon as they're announced. It also authorizes the federal government uh, to enact these as binding laws, and it creates an accessibility commissioner with a mandate to engage in enforcement, as well as some other related enforcement powers, including a complaints process. So it's got a number of good uh, kind of basic bones to the structure. However, it falls short in a number of critical ways. Now, we filed a brief with Parliament uh, a week on the 27th of September which lists some 97 recommendations. For those of you who may wonder, is this uh, lawyering work? I'm not counsel to my coalition. I'm the chair of the coalition. But I, I deployed personally and others I worked with the very skills and knowledge and analytical approach that we teach you in law school. To write a brief, it's not a whole lot different than when I write a brief for the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court of Canada, only you're uh, trying to appeal uh, to a different audience. Uh, in not just arguing uh, the kind of pre uh, precedent or principles you do in a law uh, and learn in a law classroom and then use in a courtroom, but rather principles we can teach you in a law classroom uh, and that will influence policy makers. That uh, brief, which is over 100 pages long, is available at aodaalliance.org slash Canada, um, goes into a great deal of detail, but we've just released yesterday a document which boils it down to four pages and seven ideas. By the way, uh, many in my coalition have said that only Lepofsky and a bunch of lawyers uh, could write a document that's 100 pages long and call it a brief. <laughs> Welcome to the lobbyists. Uh, so what are these ideas? First, 
While the law, uh, Bill C-81, commendably says uh, that it aims to achieve a barrier, a Canada without barriers, when it comes to the actual purpose clause in the act, which will govern the interpretation of it, it doesn't say that. It says something different. It says the purpose of the law is to, uh, is for the progressive realization of a Canada without barriers. And the terms progressive realization could be fully fulfilled by one new ramp somewhere in Canada per year now into eternity. There's no deadline. In compelling contrast, the Ontario legislation, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act 2005, a law which has got its foibles, but which has some good, uh, very important components, it sets a deadline. It was passed in 05, and it provides that Ontario is to become fully accessible. It doesn't use the word fully. Canada, Ontario is to become accessible by 2025. It set 20 years. Now, we're behind schedule, but that's immaterial to the policy point here. The law should set a deadline. It should, the can, Bill C81 should declare a year by which Canada is to become accessible. What deadline are we asking for? We haven't offered a number because we're encouraging the federal government through discussions with us, with obligated industries and so on, to try to arrive at a number that is ambitious but achievable uh, through a discussion with, uh, uh, through all of us. Uh, and we didn't want to tie anybody's hands by locking to a number and then saying, hey, if you don't do this number, then obviously you're not listening and that kind of thing. So that's the first problem. The second problem with the bill is it gives the federal government a whole lot of powers but no duties. It says they can establish a standards organization, but doesn't require it. It says they can appoint a minister, but doesn't require it. It says they can ex establish accessibility regulations, but doesn't require it. So under this bill, it's great the government has a bunch of new powers, but if there's any one thing you know uh, from observing government, I know from both lobbying government and working in government, the word may has to become the word shall, or else people get busy with other things. Ministers take office, they turn to lawyers and they say, what can I do? And they, then they say, what do I have to do? And if they don't have to do it, they're way less likely to do it. So we're calling on the federal government to not only grant itself and the various agencies that establish their mandates, to giving them powers, give them duties and timelines within which they must act. The message has been learned in uh, Manitoba where its accessibility legislation uh, also gives the provincial governments a, a bunch of powers, but in some cases they haven't taken action on them and they're desperately needed and overdue. And as a result, uh, Manitoba is, like Ontario, falling behind uh, uh, on its legislative implementation. So that's the second area of deficiency. The third area of deficiency is this. It's good that the federal legislation requires major uh, organizations. The federal legislation doesn't regulate mom and pop corner stores. It's more mainly large organizations like the federal government itself, or Canada Post, or Air Canada, or Bell Canada, or Via Rail. Uh, it requires them to establish uh, uh, accessibility plans to explain what they're going to do uh, to act on accessibility. But it doesn't require these plans to be any good. Their plan could be written on the back of a postage stamp. It could say they're going to do one ramp per year or one retrofitted website uh, per year. And that's all they say they're going to do. That's all they are going to say they're going to do. Even if they adopt a good plan, which the bill doesn't require, the act doesn't require them to implement the plan. Ontario's <coughs> legislation is different. Our accessibility standards enacted under law requires plans uh, to be established, sets requirements for what they need to include, and also requires them to be implemented. Now again, in Ontario, we're not doing a good job of enforcing this requirement, ensuring it's met, but that's a separate issue, one I'm going to get to in a moment. Uh, having a, a requirement for accessibility plans, uh, again, when Rogers or Bell Canada turn to their lawyers and say, well, what have I got to do? Um, what's the mandatory minimum? to provide, to meet this requirement, you can expect that at least some of them are just going to do the mandatory minimum. And that mandatory minimum should require features that ensure it's a good plan or be required that the plans be implemented. The, uh, the next problem with the bill 
it is that uh, uh, it does provide for enforcement, and that's good, uh, but it splinters the bill's implementation uh, and enforcement over a number of federal agencies rather than concentrating in one place. So in the area of setting accessibility standards, it doesn't just say uh, CASDO can recommend them, this new standards organization, that's great. But then who will enact them if they want to? Well, the federal cabinet can make some over transportation, the Canadian Transportation Agency can make some, and uh, over broadcast and telecom and related services, the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission, CRTC, can make some. When it comes to enforcement, some complaints will be enforceable by the Accessibility Commissioner, this new body they're creating. The uh, transportation, uh, uh, compliance will largely be enforced by the Canadian Transportation Agency, CTA. Broadcast telecom is going to be enforced largely by the CRTC. Uh, complaints related to federal government employees are going to be enforced through a, uh, the existing Federal Labor Relations Tribunal that deals with federal employment. This is a mess. It is unduly complicated. It is incredibly confusing. I have trouble reading this legislation and this is an area of specialty for me. If I'm running into difficulty, what are other lawyers going to experience? What are non-lawyers going to experience? If a law is hard to read, it's going to be hard to get it effectively implemented. Not only that, but it creates a very confusing enforcement system for people with disabilities. Rather than having the one-stop shopping that we want and need, it makes us have to sort out where do we properly go. And it gets confusing, uh, even more confusing, because once you get there, the enforcement procedures are going to be different depending which agency you go to. They don't all have to have the same forms, deadlines, and processes. Well, for people with disabilities, that is going to be incredibly confusing. But it gets worse, because obligated organizations, any of them that don't want to follow the law, any of them that want to slow down the regulatory state, well, lawyers that they hire have a standard operating procedure. It's not unique to disability. It's not unique to federal legislation. It's certainly not new. And that standard operating procedure is find all the legal barriers you can throw in the way. One of the great ways to start is you brought your case to the wrong agency. And what? You think you're in the right place? Well, I'm going to federal court to judicially review you. There goes another year. There go thousands of dollars in legals. Great for the lawyers defending these but not really great at ensuring that we make progress on accessibility. That's bad enough, but it gets worse. See, here's the added problem. We have deep and abiding difficulty with the fact that this legislation gives the key mandate over transportation services to the Canadian Transportation Agency and key responsibility for broadcast and telecom and related phone and cell services uh, to the CRTC. Why is that? <clears throat> Both of those agencies have already got a mandate to implement and enforce measures on accessibility. Now, the law would expand it, but they do have a track record. And to use uh, technical legal terms, uh, I don't know if you reached these yet in your, in your law studies, their track record sucks. <laughs> I'm not saying they've done nothing, but they've done far less than they should. So if I could give you an example, if you watch TV, some people still watch TV, to get a TV, you get cable services or, or, uh, or Bell 5 services or whichever company you're with, you got to use a PVR. Well, if you're blind or dyslexic, you can't read the guide on the screen. Now, the US Congress passed legislation requiring accessible technology like this some years ago. So the technology is out there. And some cable companies in Canada, I, I won't mention any names, but the initials are Shaw, uh, <laughs> I'm given to understand, do provide an accessible PVR. But others, I won't mention any other names, but the initials are Bell Canada, <laughs> have advised me when I asked that they don't. And where's the CRTC on this? I guess it's news to the CRTC that, like, we need to be able to use a PVR too? Like, if they can't handle this, when they've had mandate up until now, 
how can we entrust them with, with this new legislation? Uh, <coughs> It's not unusual for regulatory agencies that regulate one industry or one <coughs> cluster of industries to themselves be too close to that industry. Whether the officials that work there are revolving door uh, folks who come from the industry, whatever it may be, we have a real concern about this. We would rather have all accessibility standards made by cabinet, all accessibility enforcement made by the access uh, done by the accessibility commissioner. It's simple. It's quicker, it's cheaper, and it's going to be more effective. The only interest that the splintering of this bill's implementation serves are those who want less progress. The only interest is, oh, and the bureaucracies that don't want to lose the, or, or don't, that want, I should say, want to expand their mandates. And one thing I know from working in government, and it's no brilliant insight on my part, bureaucracies like to expand their mandates rather than see it go somewhere else. I will tell you that the regulated industries, the Air Canada's and WestJet's and Bell Canada's and Rogers of the world, I'm sure they're ecstatic that this stuff, that these, this mandate's going over to CRTC and to the CTA. The, that they are ecstatic, and I'm sure they are, worries me and worries a lot of us. So we've said end the splintering, make the law simpler, make it easier to understand, make it cheaper to implement, make it quicker to implement, and make it promote more accessibility. Fairly compelling case, I should think. So the next problem with the law, maybe losing him, is that, that we've identified uh, is that it's got too many loopholes. It's got too many <coughs> loopholes. Um, it provides, all legislation delegates powers uh, for making regulations. This legislation delegates too many. And the effect of the sweeping powers that it gives the cabinet and other bodies, like CRTC and CTA, is that the current government, no doubt, wants to see this law do well. That's why they <coughs> promised it. That's why they're championing it now. And credit to them for doing that. However, that doesn't stay forever. You can get a new government, we've seen this both in Ontario and in Manitoba, where things slow down. You can get an existing government, the very government that passes it, after all the excitement of the law passing, after a cabinet shuffle or whatever may come along, or a change in leadership in the party, whatever it may be, things can slow down. We've seen that in Manitoba, we've seen that in Ontario. These laws have to be drafted to survive successive governments. And it's not good enough that all parties vote for the law, though that's critical. In Ontario, the law passed unanimously. Same in Manitoba, same in Nova Scotia. It's important that it require, that it both impose obligatory man, uh, uh, measures and timelines, as I've discussed, but it also has got to make it harder to weaken the law. If a government, a successive government wants to weaken the law, they should have to bring a bill before parliament, face the political music, face the public debate, face opposition parties, face the media attention. Under this bill, there are so many powers given to cabinet that a successive government could substantially weaken, if not gut this legislation, through the amend, but simply by passing regulations. And regulations are passed in cabinet, which meets in private. So we won't know it's <coughs> happened until after it's happened. Regulations don't get the same media and public attention that legislation debated before Parliament gets. In fact, in our case, a bill to get passed federally has to go through the House of Commons and the Senate. <clears throat> There's nothing equivalent uh, for regulation, so we're concerned about that. As well, this bill gives powers to uh, the uh, uh, various federal officials, uh, depending on which industry is in, in, in place, to grant exemptions to <coughs> any organization it wants from various uh, of the accessibility obligations, not all, but various of the accessibility obligations uh, under the bill. And again, this can be done in secret. We'll find out after. It can be done in, uh, uh, without reasons. It can be done even though the exempted organization may have a lousy track record on accessibility. It can be done even if that organization had a good track record, uh, but later uh, came along and started getting worse. Uh, and the 
I, I, taking it to work, the government could exempt itself. They could, let's all celebrate this legislation and right afterwards say, by the way, we're exempted. Which, none of this makes any sense. Like, why should they need any exemptions? The government sets the accessibility <coughs> standards. It gives timelines for getting things done. It ten, will set those timelines based on what it thinks uh, organizations need. It makes no sense to do this. So the, um, similarly, there's nothing in the legislation to ensure that nothing done in the legislation makes things worse for us. Ontario's legislation uh, does include a guarantee that ensures uh, that wherever there's two confl uh, a conflict in, if there's more than one law on accessibility, the stronger law wins. And that's what we want under the federal law. As well, we want it made clear that nothing can be done under this legislation to make things worse for us on accessibility, to take away rights we already have. The final problem I'll outline, uh, in a 100-page brief, or more than a 100-page brief, you can imagine we've got more to say than this, but the final problem is this. We need the key enforcement organizations and agencies to be fully independent of the federal government. We've learned in Ontario and I believe we've learned in Manitoba that where the enforcement agency, the implementation agency, is buried within the, uh, the existing public service bureaucracy, that slows progress. And it slows progress because in any jurisdiction, federal, Manitoba, Ontario, <coughs> wherever, the largest organization, the number one organization that's got to comply, the organization that's got the most to do, is the government. So. Uh, an, an office or directorate or secretariat buried within the very bureaucracy <coughs> is in a con conflict position. And it's the most susceptible to political pressure to slow down action. And we've seen that very problem <coughs> certainly in Ontario in, 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 uh, you know, uh, more than once. So we've said to the federal government, you need to ensure that the process of developing accessibility standards and the process of enforcement is fully independent of government. Now, to the government, federal government's credit, there are some parts of the bill which try to achieve some of this, but not enough. We want the accessibility commissioner to report to parliament, not the minister. We want the standards organization, standards development organization, CASDO, to report to parliament, not the government. Uh, they create a new chief accessibility officer, to be kind of a watchdog, if not a watchdog, but a commentator on progress, we want them to report to parliament, not the government. None of them do. And we've said, please amend it to change that, and if you don't change that, at least can you establish some functional <coughs> independence in their day-to-day -day operations to insulate them from uh, efforts by the government to slow action when the government is not in the role of policymaker, but the government's in the role of, uh, as a party obliged to comply and respond. The, um, so far, we haven't seen what the federal government's going to say in response to all that. This is our chance to get our message across. We have heard from the federal government, either publicly or privately, uh, through conversations that people have reported back to us, that they're looking at solving the splintered implementation problem with what I consider a simple Band-Aid solution. Their solution would be to have like a, what they might call one door to get in. So instead of worrying about which organization you have to file with, if you're going to file a complaint, uh, you simply have one central place, you file it there, and they internally refer it. This is to me what happens when you ask a lawyer to solve a medical problem. Okay, if Lawyers have a certain way of thinking. I'm one of them, so I'm as notorious as, bad, as the rest. If you ask the lawyer to solve stomach flu, what they would say is, why don't you just duct tape the person's mouth shut? <laughs> it's not a solution. It's cosmetic, but it like doesn't work, and if you think about it, and please don't think about it, it the side effects are not so productive. Uh, so what do you do? What's wrong with it? Well, it doesn't solve the problem of multiple organizations making accessibility standards. It doesn't solve the problem that CRTC and CTA have a lousy track record on uh, uh, using the powers they now have in the sense, not that they've done nothing, but that there's a lot more they could have done all this time and haven't, and there's no excuse. It doesn't solve the problem that even if this uh, one bureaucrat who receives all these complaints gets to your complaint after however long it takes to, and they refer it to an agency, it doesn't stop an obligated organization 
from going to federal court and saying they referred it to the wrong organization. It doesn't solve the problem that each of these agencies have different internal procedures, different you know, and, and that people with disabilities will be stuck trying to figure out how to navigate all of these. So what do we do? Let me wrap up with just a couple of thoughts. We are before Parliament now, as are a number of disability groups, coming up with different recommendations, but crystallizing around these, among other themes. One thing I've learned about advocacy in a broad community, like the community of people with disabilities, you can't achieve unanimity, but you can aim for harmony, and that's what we're working on. What can you do? Uh, let me suggest uh, four things. First, did I mention following us on Twitter? <laughs> you haven't done it yet? Take that phone out. You still can. It's still not rude. After this lecture, it becomes rude again. But right now, it's OK. Um, uh, or sign up for our updates uh, to learn more. Um, if you look at what we are proposing at aodaalliance.org slash Canada You Agree, um, there's an update posted there right now which suggests to you that you send a one-sentence email to the Standing Committee and the Minister simply endorsing what we have to say. If you've got endorsing our, our brief that the AODA Alliance sent. So in other words, we've done uh, this is like the fast food of political action. We do it all for you to steal McDonald's old slogan. Um, if you have added ideas, of course, add them too. But this is your chance with one email to add your voice and to encourage others to do it. The second thing I want to say, so that, those are a couple of ideas for immediate action for you as individuals. Uh, but let me um, focus on uh, two other longer term uh, suggestions. Uh, the law school here has a commendable focus on human rights. And it is expanding its focus on human rights. Law schools, I believe, have an incredible potential to have an impact, <clears throat> to be a place where we teach law students about the subject matter, such as the issues uh, that people with disabilities face uh, and the way the law can help them, and teaching them about how to take the knowledge that we give you for le uh, in the area of legal analysis and how to transform that not only into writing factums for courts or legal memos for corporate clients or government clients, but also teaching you how to translate that into skills that can be used in the broader area of community organizing and community activism. Heck, there's a guy who graduated from law school uh, a couple of decades ago and went into the area of community organizing and he found it uh, an effective skill when he went on to win the presidency of the United States in 2008. That's Barack Obama's background as a community organizer. It's, it's a skill set that we don't spend enough time and a focus that we don't spend enough time in any law school focusing on. Your law school's focus on human rights uh, could be ex commendably expanded in this area. If I can play particularly proud of where I teach right now, Osgood has a disability law intensive program. Uh, I'm a visiting professor and my contract has been extended and starting in January, my title will be visiting professor of disability rights and legal education. And I am delighted to help your law school out. And by the way, I do this, I'm happy to do it uh, either remotely or to visit you. And I don't charge for my time. So I'd be happy to help. So there's lots of opportunities where either bringing people in from the outside to give advice and to offer uh, training, but it's also an opportunity for you to share with your faculty members, and faculty members are present to share with your other faculty members ways in which this faculty, in its commendable work uh, of focusing on human rights, can ensure that that expanding, <coughs> that that current focus and that expanding focus uh, includes uh, uh, equality and full inclusion and full participation for people uh, with disabilities. The final thing I want to talk to you about and, uh, is this. The campaign for accessibility legislation in Manitoba is hitting a pivotal moment right now. A tremendous group formed back in 2008 uh, on its own here in Manitoba. They called themselves Barrier Free Manitoba. They formulated the idea of accessible legislation for Manitoba. They organized the community. They led the campaign that led in 2013 uh, to, to, to achieve 
of the success of that legislation passing and getting it passed unanimously. This was a homegrown effort. At various points, uh, we had the honor of them reaching out to us for some ideas and thoughts, and we and they together shared the idea of Manitoba learning from what Ontario did well, but doing better uh, in the areas where Ontario fell short. And we're also sharing our voice uh, nationally, trying to influence uh, the strengthening of Bill C-81. Our common message, the Bill C-81, can be made into a good law with proper uh, amendments to strengthen it. Uh, well, Barrier-Free Manitoba is still now championing the area, the efforts of uh, trying to get the Accessibility for Manitobans Act implemented because the current government is falling behind on key issues, on developing accessibility standards and on putting in place an effective uh, enforcement compliance and monitoring <coughs> regime that the legislation uh, mandates. But Barry Free Manitoba, and, and tonight you can learn more about that if you come to the uh, public talk I'm giving uh, tonight, but Barry Free Manitoba has decided that they're wrapping up their uh, coalition at the end of this year. And they're doing that not because the work is finished, but because the people who've dedicated a decade to it, who've done a fantastic job, um, have uh, um, exhausted their energy uh, and feel it's time to pass the torch on. Uh, and I respect both the incredible dedication of the work they've done, and I respect the, I, and fully understand what it means to be exhausted, and I fully understand the need to uh, look to reinvigorating the movement by passing the torch along. We need people to take that torch. And so if you sign up to get the email updates, or you come tonight, or you talk to me, or you talk to the consultant in the room for, uh, um, uh, for Barry Free Manitoba, Patrick Faulkner, who's sitting uh, towards the back, a good friend and a tremendous talent, we are happy to help try to pull together a cluster, whether it's among students, or faculty members, or both, and others in the community to, to, to take this torch and carry it forward. There is a lot to be done, and there is a need for people to take up this torch to get advice and guidance from those who carried the torch up till now, but to take on the leadership role. And having seen these kinds of transitions in other places at other times, this is for you as law students a tremendous opportunity. You might figure, Look, I'm really busy. I don't have time. Can I tell you something? As a community organizer, the only people I like to organize are people who say, I'm really busy. I don't have time. Because they're the people who, even if they give 15 minutes a week, can eke out the most productive uh, 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 effort. So don't try the I'm really busy line. It actually will work against you uh, when, when we, we encourage you to take part. Rather, I want you to think about whether you might be able to engage some of your time, some of your thoughts, whether it's now or later, in helping uh, take that torch and kindle a new successor, whether it carries under the same name Barry Free Manitoba or however they decide to proceed uh, in carrying this forward. Because Manitoba needs it, your skills training applies to it, the faculty's commitment to human rights is in complete sync with it, and the capacity to both learn and make a huge difference um, is extraordinary. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to meet with you today. If time permits, I'm, I'm delighted to take a couple, uh, take some questions. And I wish you all the best in your legal education. Thanks very much. Thank you.